Great. Thank you for the really nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. You know, I'm not really going to do much of an introduction. I'm going to jump into the, the talk because I feel like you will learn a little bit about me and my thought process, even as I share my journey of, of how I discovered and adopted this uh, extreme ownership mindset. Okay, so let me share my screen. I have a few slides I'm going to use. So I'm going to talk about extreme ownership as a product manager. And I already feel a little weird talking about this topic because if I'm being honest with myself, this is not the hat. This is not how, how I have shown up for most of my career, right? This is something that I discovered and adopted kind of later in the later part of my career, right? So, you know, in the beginning part, in, in the uh, earlier part of my career, I was very much somebody who stayed in my lane, right? So if the problem was in this area, I am responsible for solving it. If it's not in my area, you need to go talk to somebody else. And this one incident really stands out in my mind. And it's kind of embarrassing when I think back about it. Um, you know, I my uh, the team that I was part of went through a reorg and we got a new leader. My manager was scrambling to put together some information to bring this leader up to speed about what we do, what are initiatives, you know, the impact, the status, et cetera, you know, just the, the normal rundown. So she had created a list with the, the, the initiatives and she sent me that deck that, hey, can you fill in the details? And I picked the ones, the initiatives that I was working on, and I filled in the details and I sent her back. And she said, well, what about the rest of them? And I was like, well, I don't own them. They're not mine. And then she's like, yeah, but we need the information. And I didn't really get the hint that she wanted me to do it. And I pushed back. I was like, yeah, but they are not mine. And then she kind of took a deep breath. She's like, Parul, this is our part portfolio. These are our initiatives. Right? And at that point, I, at least thankfully, I was smart enough to know that, okay, I need to just get on with it. I need to do it. But I wasn't really happy about it. I did it, but I remember I was like, why is she making me do this work, which is not mine, right? And you know, now that I think about it, this was a reorg, right? There were, there were changes in team, there were changes in roles and responsibilities, and there could have been an opportunity for more responsibility for me, right? But do you think after that conversation with my manager, she was thinking, oh, I should give Parul a bigger role. I should, she's ready for more responsibility. Probably not, right? So my role did not change, unsurprisingly, after that reorg. And the way I discovered this idea of uh, extreme ownership is by this book, by this name of extreme ownership, by Joko Willink. He's an ex-Navy SEAL. You know, it is, if you haven't read the book, I would highly, highly recommend it. Right? And the way he describes extreme ownership is that you must own everything in your world, right? There is nobody else to blame. If something goes wrong, you have to hold yourself accountable. You have to hold yourself responsible. And even though, uh, even before I had read this book, you know, there are people I had interacted with who showed up this way, right? The, the, the level of commitment uh, in making their product successful, like the, the length they were willing to go to, to make something happen was just extremely impressive. And I, when I would interact with such people, I would be like, this is what I want to be like. Like, I want what they are doing. I want to do what they are doing. But I didn't really know what it was. Right? I couldn't put my finger on it until I read this book. And, you know, what I was seeing and what I wanted to embody was extreme ownership. Right. So, again, if you haven't read the book, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, Another tool, so you know, then since then I kind of adopted the 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 extreme ownership mindset, or at least I tried to. But another tool that really helps me stay grounded and helps me assess whether I'm really showing up as an extreme owner or not is this accountability ladder, right? It's a tool that my career coach introduced me to. And this is something that I actually uh, use quite often. So it's actually a ladder. Right. And if you look at the four, the last four rungs, the bottom rungs of this ladder, 
that they're more of a victim mindset where you don't think that you have the power to change something or you don't think it's your role to change something. So the way a victim mindset or victim behavior shows up is things are happening to you. Right. So, oh, I don't think I can change this. This is not my responsibility. This other person needs to be blamed. Hopefully something will change. Right. And the four rungs above this red line, the top part of the ladder is where you are showing up as a, as an owner. You are taking accountability. You are acknowledging that, yes, things are not perfect. I have to work with this, this reality, whatever is in front of me. I'm going to make find solutions and I'm going to try to make it happen. Right. So now, you know, when when I kind of feel stuck, I open this tool, I open this ladder, I open this picture and I'm like, where am I showing up? Right. And if I am kind of st stuck in a negative loop in my mind, kind of blaming somebody, being unhappy, then I make an active effort to to, you know, to make a switch to the top of the ladder. How can I climb this ladder? How can I show up differently? Right. So, so as I mentioned, I made a conscious effort to adopt this extreme ownership mindset. And I kind of started seeing some results, right? And I wanted to share with you the three things that I have noticed. Number one is career growth because uh, I am delivering more impact. I don't give up as easily, right? I'm more willing to take control, make things happen rather than depending on others. So it has definitely helped me with career growth. Number two, which this was a little bit of a surprising one for me, was stronger bonds with my team, with the people I work with. Because one of the things that, that holds people back in showing up as an extreme owner is the fear of stepping on other people's toes, right? What if I upset somebody, right? But if you show up as an extreme owner where your goal is that, you know, that we are all successful, you're actually helping others be successful. You're not really stepping on their toes. You're not blaming them. You're helping them be successful, right? So if anything, you build stronger bonds you also find other people in the organization who show up as an extreme owner, right? So you actually build your network of high, high performing individuals. And finally, higher satisfaction, right? You can imagine just feeling helpless, feeling like I don't really have control over this is not really a great feeling, right? On the other hand, when I, re when I wear my, okay, I am going to take extreme ownership, I'm going to move forward with this, then my brain just starts working differently, right? Then I'm more focused on how do I move forward how do I solve this rather than being stuck in that place, right? So it definitely has led to you know, increased satisfaction. It has led to just overall, overall uh, higher level of happiness since I have adopted this mind shift, this, uh, mind shift. So I will say it's not easy showing up as, uh, as an extreme owner, right? Because basically wherever the problem is, you, you are designated yourself as the person who needs to solve for it. It's not easy, but it is very rewarding. I wanted to share with you three common scenarios where as, product, as a product manager, I used to feel like things are not in my control, but over time I have learned, actually I can have quite a bit more control in this situation. There is a lot more than I can do, than I was doing earlier. Okay. First one is execution. Right? Execution is the bread and butter of product managers. Uh, you know, whether you are an associate product manager, whether you are a chief product officer, uh, you your main responsibility is to ship the product, right? And I think the the excellence in execution is really key for for career growth, right? Uh, but we all know anybody who has been a part of any execution, there are things that can go wrong, right? Now I have included a list of things uh, that commonly go wrong with, you know, with poor execution or the reasons for poor execution. It is an incomplete list, right? You will not see things like scope creep or miss requirements in, in this list because they are very much product owned, right? And then we are obviously accountable and responsible for those, but these are the other ones which might or might not fall on a product manager, right? So lack of planning, maybe the, the analysis done up front wasn't thorough enough. There were complexities uh, that weren't discovered until much later, right? And basically it, that impacted your scope, your timeline. Communication breakdown, right? Did we tell this team that we need work from them? Oh, I thought you told them, right? So there are these dependencies, for example, that could be discovered later on. 
slow decision making. It could be a technical decision. You know, this is this is something that happens quite a bit in our world. You would hear engineering, oh, these are the two different approaches. These are pros and cons. But sometimes it takes so long to make the decision uh, that it has actually impacted your delivery timeline. Okay, so these are some of the common reasons. I'm sure uh, all of you can add probably five more or much many more to this list, right? But really the impact is either that your launch is delayed or you are able to launch, but it's not what you had expected. It's subpar quality. Right? Now, as product managers, we are close to execution, right? We are not blind to these issues. Then why don't we intervene? Right? So these are some of the, the some of the reasons that I have that have held me back in the past. Number one is kind of like willful ignorance. You're like, well, it's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem to solve. Like, you know, this technical decision, if it delays the project, engineering will be blamed. It's not my problem, right? The second one is fear of stepping on toes, right? If I basically say, hey, we need this decision, um, you know, it, it's not, you know, the engineering might not see it as product's role to drive this decision. A program might be upset that I'm trying to do their role, right? And then not wanting to seem difficult. I will say that the third one is something I have to actively override even now. You know, we have a, a portfolio read, readout and sometimes the information is presented about a project that I don't understand. So I ask a question and then the response still doesn't make sense to me. Then I ask another question. But at some point I become very self-conscious, like am I being difficult? And I have to actively override it. That for me, the most important thing is this project, this product is successful. And if that means I have to, I come across as difficult, I am okay paying that price. So if you are somebody uh, who's held back for similar reasons, what helped me get over them was like telling this to myself, right? This is how I adopted extreme uh, owner mi mindset in an execution uh, context, which is I am accountable for successful execution. Whether my product or project launches on time, high quality or not, like it's my accountable. I am accountable for it. Right? I am the owner for it. Doesn't matter where the problem is. I need to make sure that in spite of those problems, it still delivers. Right? And once I once I think of myself this way, then the, the, then you know then showing up differently becomes much, much easier. Right. As a product manager, obviously, we can't really jump in and code. Right? There are a lot of things that are outside of our control right, where we might not have the skill set to help out. One thing that we can do as product managers do when we own, as, we own execution is to remove ambiguity. Ambiguity is the number one enemy of, of smooth, seamless execution, right? So strive for clarity. So the, the, there are some, here are some of the, some of the examples of how you can remove ambiguity. Number one is set context, right? So why are we doing this? What are we doing? Who are our customers? Why is the timeline important? Make sure that you have shared this context with your team so that they can make good decisions independently. Number two is ask questions, right? And what I was just talking about and go deep, right? get to a level where you feel comfortable with, with the answers. So, so I wanted to share with you another experience. Uh, this happened a few years ago uh, that, you know, we miraculously found uh, a short-term solution for a pretty severe customer pain point, right? And it was supposed to be this low-hanging fruit, you know, we can, get, we can do the MVP and launch 200% in one quarter. So I was super happy. It took us two and a half quarters to push it out, right? And we actually incurred quite a bit of technical debt in doing that, right? And so when I kind of realized what well, is going to be delayed and it's not a small delay, it's significant delay, I was pretty upset. And my first instinct was to blame others, like, play, so, oh, you know, why didn't they discover these problems? That, why didn't they know this already? But then I realized if I, like, I had also bought into that optimism, I hadn't really done my due diligence because if I had asked a few basic questions, I could have helped the team discover some of these problems in advance, or at least be better prepared for them. So one of my favorite questions is, why do you believe this to be true? Right? We are not really challenging somebody. You're just trying to understand what information they have that gives them confidence or that, that helps them form a certain point of view. Right? So ask questions and go deep until you are satisfied. Right? 
drive decision making. It doesn't have to be a product decision. Right? If it's product decision, you're absolutely responsible for that decision making. Technical decision, some other is outside of product area. If there is a decision that where you feel like the teams are dragging their feet, this is a key decision, it's going to hold back your execution, take reins, right? Set up the meeting, go talk to people, do whatever it takes to make sure the right decision is made on time. And then finally, escalate as needed. If you're not getting you know, cooperation, if you don't, you don't see things moving, you have done everything in your power, escalate as needed. Like, don't let it go. I feel like though, if you look at this ladder on the, the left side of the screen, execution is an area where you can climb pretty much to the top of the ladder. Like we have a lot of control in execution and making sure it, it's done successfully. Right. And make that effort. You know, over time, I have realized I can spend hours and days coming up with these beautiful strategy decks. But unless somebody executes on them successfully, they are worthless. They're useless. They're just, you know, there's just a pretty deck. So make sure that if there's one area where you wear this extreme ownership hat, make it execution. And again, irrespective of your level, of your level, associate product manager, senior product manager, execution is one area where you really want to show up as the owner. Okay. Let's move to the second area, decision-making, right? When a decision is made, being made about your product, but you're not the decision maker. And an example of it is uh, prioritization or resourcing. And so we, maybe you went through uh, annual planning recently for 2023. Right. So, you know, this is these are discussions usually at the leadership level next year. What should we invest in? Right. Is your product or investment in your product a priority? Are you going to get the resourcing you requested? Now, let us say if the if the decision goes against you, the impact is, uh, you know, whatever customer need your product was solving for that would be met. You know, if there was team who was really invested in this problem statement, their team morale might be impacted. Right. So, Stakes for you are pretty high when there is a decision impacting your product, even though somebody else is making it. And some of the reasons why I haven't intervened in the past is like, oh, it's not my place. Like, you know, maybe my manager is like, it's my manager's place, my manager's manager's place. Like, it's more of a leadership discussion or decision. You know, I who am I to, to contribute to it? Upsetting peers, I have also worried about coming across as over advocating for my product and almost like implying that my area is more important than others. And the third one is this assumption that I have realized is never to make is, oh, execs have all of the information they need. You know, I don't know if you have been in a scenario where, you know, you're in a meeting and you're not really getting what's being discussed. Uh, you ask a question and you realize that nobody knows what's going on, right? It's not exactly the same thing, but this assumption that, you know, people have the information they need is, isn't always the right one. In fact, most of the time that's, it's an in, inaccurate assumption. So the way I get over these, these uh, hesitations is I tell myself that I am an active participant in this decision-making, but the way I participate is by influencing. Right. That's my role. That's that's how I show up as an extreme owner in this area. So what does that look like? Uh, again, share context, right? Educate about the impact. Uh, you know, in, in the book, Extreme Ownership, uh, Joko talks about leading up and down the chain, right? Leading down the chain is kind of, it's, it's well understood, right? For your team, you kind of set the goal, you set the context. But there is also something called leading up the chain, right? And, and the idea is, Let's say my manager, for example, they have a broader uh, purview than mine, right? They might know what's happening in other areas of the company, which I might not have uh, visibility into. But I have a deeper understanding of what's happening in my area, right? I know more than him about the technical constraints, the customer pain points, uh, you know, what some of our challenges are. And both of these need to come together to make the right decision. Right. So if my manager is making a decision, it's for me to lead up the chain. It's for me to make sure he has the relevant information. Another power tool, powerful tool in this area is influence through others. Right. So I think my manager is used to me advocating for my product. Like I, I'm also biased. I also think my product is super important. Right. But I think what would really help him is instead of me advocating for my product, 
the customers, internal or external customers advocate for it. So sometimes I would do that. If there is a prioritization decision being made, I would let my internal partners know, hey, there is this discussion happening. You know, if you want to go talk to my manager, share your perspective, uh, that could help uh, him make the prioritization decision, right? Provide options. This is this has really helped me make the move the decision away from black and white, right? So either we invest or we don't invest. So, um, you know, a, a few years ago, I identified this unmet customer need and I made this business case that I needed a, an engineering team of like, I don't remember, like five to six people to deliver on it. And I did a presentation to the exec, pretty senior uh, in the company, and they shot me down. They're like, no, you know, you're asking for, for more resources. So is everybody else. This, this is not going to work. And I was extremely demotivated by that. But then my VP came and talked to me afterwards. And she was like, the two, I'll give you two pieces of feedback. Number one, you can't go and ask for like an engineering team of 10. You need to give him options. Like two engineers, we can start, we can do this. Three engineers, we can do this. Like give him a few options. And the second thing is show incremental value, right? Don't be make it like, oh, at the end of six months, you will see value, like deliver value along the way, right? And so I redid that presentation and then I was able to get a small team to get started, right? So, so if you feel like it could be turning into a black and white decision, uh, give them options, which makes it easier for execs to, to, uh, to make the decision, right? So, uh, oh, sorry, let me just go back to one more thing. I would say for decision-making that's outside of your control, you might not be able to go all the way to the top, top of the accountability ladder, right? Because truly the outcome is outside of your control, but you can still have a, a large influence on it. You can find solutions uh, and help executives deliver those and make that effort, right? In the, usually in these cases, the stakes are high enough. Finally, the hardest one, but also the most important one are people related problems, right? So as product managers, um, our success depends on large cross-functional team doing their jobs well, right? And, you know, this, this, is, this is something that I have I've come to accept over time. I remember there were, you know, times I was extremely frustrated because I didn't feel like I got the rating I deserved or the money I deserved, uh, even though I was doing my job well. You know, somebody else didn't do their job well, the product didn't launch, but I did my job. Over time, I have realized that's the role I signed up for, right? That's what a product manager's role is. You are accountable for the success of the product and bringing all of these people along to do their job well. But, you know, things don't always go as planned. So there are times when somebody is not doing what they're supposed to do. And there could be a number of reasons. And I wanted to share the three top reasons I have discovered. Number one is they don't have the bandwidth. Right? Number two is they really want to do it. It's a kind of a stretch goal for them. They don't really have the skills to be successful in that role yet. And the third one is the hardest one is they don't have the will. So either they are not invest invested in your product or they might see their role differently than yours. So there might not be agreement on uh, what you want them to do, right? So these are, you know, but all of them really translate into kind of a weaker link in your team, right? And the impact is either somebody has to work harder, somebody has to take on their slack, right? Which is not a, not a sustainable goal or sustainable solution, they will burn out, or um, it could lead to failure, right? Which is bad for the entire team, right? And, and this is an area where I used to be really hesitant to, to, to speak up, right? And one thing, I mean, and it is difficult. It is difficult to have these conversations, even when you do have direct authority, even if it's with people on your team, but especially if these, you know, the person who is not doing their job well, they don't report into you. It's kind of, you're like, you know, I, who am I to go have that conversation with them, right? Fear of being disliked, right? What if I tell them and then they, they hold a grudge against me? And this is an awkward conversation. This is a difficult conversation. Like I said, even with, with my team, somebody who reports to me, it's a difficult conversation to tell them, hey, these are the areas that you need to improve, right? For somebody who doesn't report to me, somebody who's a peer, um, it, it, it is a pretty awkward conversation. But what has, again, helped me get over uh, these hesitations is I tell myself that it's not about me. It's not about my authority. It's not about my position. My goal is to help the team succeed because only if the team succeeds, the product 
succeeds or the project succeeds, right? So I try to remove the focus from myself. Like it's not about how they perceive me. Uh, it's about whether the team succeeds or not, right? So I wanted to share with you a few tips of uh, how to show up as an extreme owner when, you know, when you run, run into issues with people. Right? And the main thing is to show up uh, with radical candor, right? Which basically means you care, you show up with compassion, you show up with curiosity, you want to find out what's happening with that person, but you also show up with candor. You are upfront with them about your requirements, your expectations, and the fact that they're not being met, right? So it's a combination of both. It's a combination of being compassionate. It's also, com com it's also being open and direct with them. So lack of bandwidth, I feel like is one of the easier ones, right? So you basically go and tell them, hey, you know, these are my expectations. This is what I think your role is. You know, I have noticed that you have been missing some of the timelines. And, you know, you kind of just ask them what's going on. And it becomes very clear. It could be a prioritization issue. It could be that there, there, there was something going on in their personal life, but it's over now. But once it's out in the open, right, that there is a prioritization issue, you, you know, your expectations are not being met you can talk about and find solutions, right? You can try to get them additional help. Uh, you know, worse comes to worse, you can go talk to their manager and say, hey, like I would like more, more of their time allocated to support this thing. But lack of bandwidth, like I said, it's, it's a very data-driven thing. I think it's one of the easier problems to solve. Lack of skill, slightly harder, but again, um, solvable. Right? So you realize that somebody is struggling in their role because it's kind of a stretch goal for them. And if you assess that, okay, with a little bit of help, you know, they can get there, might be worth your time to coach them. Uh, uh, you know, kind of say, hey, and I actually do that. Uh, you know, I've done that, for example, with, uh, with uh, program managers or project managers, when I'm not really in agreement with the way they are, they are presenting the, uh, the, the, the status report, like I would try to coach them and say, hey, like, these are the most important things. Can we, can we lead with them before going into detail? Right. And so you kind of coach them and then you kind of give them ongoing feedback, like areas where they improve as well as areas where you might have more feedback, right? And if they're really motivated, they really want to do, you know, they want to be a part of this journey, you would see that they actually appreciate it rather than resent it, right? So lack of skill is also very solvable. Lack of will, like I mentioned, is the hard one. Right, where it basically means there is a very foundational difference, right? Either the person is not invested in your product or they you your and their expectations of their role is not aligned. Right. This is where again bringing it out in the open helps, right? You try to align with them, uh, you try to coach them and say, This is what I have seen work in the, the past. I mean, at some point you might have to escalate to if you if the issue doesn't go away. And then or something else you have to be prepared for is short and long-term solutions, right? If this person is not, not carrying their weight, you don't really get a sense of something is going to change. Your number one priority is, again, to de-risk your product or de-risk your project. So what can you do in the short term to make sure this doesn't ne negatively impact uh, your roadmap while you work on a long-term solution? Okay. So that's my, that's the third one. Like I said, people is the hardest one, you know, I have had to do a lot of work to overcome it, my hesitation of going and coaching and asking people others. But 99% of the time, people appreciate it, right? It's very, very rare that somebody kind of pushes back and say, what are you talking about? Uh, I know we want to get to Q&A. I wanted to leave you with this, this thought, right? This is uh, Anais Nin, is, um, is, she is a writer. And she said, life ex shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And wearing this extreme ownership hat takes a lot of courage. It takes courage to care about something so deeply that you're willing to take that ownership. It takes courage to venture into areas and try to drive them when you don't know much about it, when you're trying to learn on the go. And it takes courage to have these difficult, uncomfortable conversations. But once you start to do it, you will see your life expand at work and outside. All right, so let's open up for Q&A. Maheep, I'm passing to you. Thank you, Parul. That was that was quite quite insightful, and I and I love the practical takeaways. It's it's as if you had 
uh, you know, uh, 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 somehow mind read the questions that folks have presented for today, uh, because, right. you know, uh, many of the themes are, are answered there. Okay. Um, so folks, this is what we are going to do next. There have been some questions which have been pre-presented by the audience, by you folks, when you signed up, right? I'm going to try to tease out themes from those questions and present those to Parul. If you have any questions, and I'm talking to the live attendees here, if you have any questions, please do ask them away in the Q&A section. And then towards the end, uh, we will open it up for live Q&A as well, right? So Parul, this borrows from the theme of managing up, right? You, you, you presented that theme, managing up and managing down. This is slightly related to that. Hmm. So what somebody asks is, what are some of the ways that I can show the product execs in my company that I'm ready for extreme ownership? Yes, I understand the concept of extreme ownership and your, your uh, you know, presentation was very, very helpful. Uh, they want to move up the ladder. What are some of the signals there to send to the, to the, you know, to the leadership in a way, advocating for yourself as a product. You said you talked about advocating yeah. for your product. I'm asking about advocating for yourself as a product. Got it. So a few things come to mind. Uh, you know, you know, I, I have been managing people for a while and it's very easy to see people who show up as extreme owners versus people who don't, right? And I will tell you, I mean, you can guess, uh, as a manager, which ones are easier to work with, right? I mean, if somebody shows up in, as an extreme owner, as a manager, it makes my life so much easier, right? So much easier. So the way you can advocate for yourself and to, especially to demonstrate that you're ready for extreme ownership is to already show up as an extreme owner, right? And some ways you can, practical ways you can do it, problem solving, right? Not just product related problem solving, but having a strong point of view on, oh, we have these resourcing issues. These are some ways we could think about it, right? So think broader than just product role, that think broader than you are responsible for prioritization and resourcing, right? Kind of taking a step back and say, actually a good way to think of it is my manager's role. Like this is probably what my manager cares about, right? If I were to wear that hat, if I were to take that perspective, if I were my manager, what would help them? What kind? So related to my portfolio, what's keeping them up? How can I surface and address those issues, right? So kind of this is the and you know I know it's easier said than done. I think we're just so close to what we do. It's hard to step back, but that is the single most important thing that you can do to show your readiness is take a step back take a look at the bigger picture and try to do like try to identify and solve problems there okay thank you that that's quite uh, helpful uh now this is a question which is a wider theme it's 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 been asked earlier it's it's probably been asked to you earlier in the in similar forums as well uh a big part about communication a big part about demonstrating ownership and extreme ownership mm -hmm. is influencing without authority. Mm -hmm. And this topic, especially for product managers, is very, very relevant. Yeah. What are your thoughts there? I, if, if I were to tease it out, I would say demonstrating extreme ownership when you don't have the direct authority is even more important. It's even more key. Mm -hmm. After having said that very general statement, I would love for you to tease out your thoughts on that. So, uh, Mahip, I want to make sure I understand the question. Uh, yeah. Let's say I care deeply about, you know, the success of the product that I'm working on and I need to influence somebody. How yeah. how do I do that? Yes, yes. That you don't have formal authority over them. You you They are not in your dotted line of leadership. They are not in your manager's dotted line. Uh, you know, you have you have indirect authority over them in a way. How do you how do you then you know work with this concept of extreme ownership? Yeah, I so there are two things that I have done uh, that have helped me. One is kind of aligning on the goal upfront, on a common goal. 
right? That our goal is that our launch is successful. Our goal is that this pain point for our customers is resolved, right? And I feel like once you establish that common goal, right, you can then come up with a plan to work towards it together, right? At least you, you might start with different points of view, but at least you know your goal is the same, right? The second thing is, uh, especially in a conversation like this, making your intent clear up front, right? So something like, you know, I want to make sure that you are super successful in this role, right? I want to make sure that you are maximizing your impact, right? So you're not coming at it from an angle of blaming them. You're not coming at it from an angle of challenging them. You're coming at, at it from a place of where you want to help them, right? Now, they might say no to your help, right? But at least exp explicitly express that intent, right? That I want you to be super successful in that role. Right? These are a few things I've observed. And I think these are a few things that you can do. Um, and like I said, like I used to be, I, I used to have, if I knew I had a conversation like this coming up, like I used to have sleepless nights, but over time I have been pleasantly surprised by how well people take it. Uh, but, you know, there are people who are willing to listen. They thank you. They don't change anything. There are people who change something. Right. And I think then you have to assess, is it worth having a second conversation with them or not? Yes. And I and I would echo that. This is what I have seen in my experience as well, that if yeah. you show up, you acknowledge that people are busy. You are your yeah. professional, you are civil about it and that you convey your point of view or at least you take the you have the courage to display you, you know, to present your point of view. People more often than not are willing to help. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, so definitely I would, I would, uh, you know, echo those sentiments. Now, uh, one of the things, and, and this is really about managing down in a way or, or managing around, uh, they are asking, how do I disseminate this concept of extreme ownership within my team? Their exact question is, how can my, how can I encourage my team to be more confident in their decision making? right? There's an, there's an element of risk taking in product. So I am, the theme that I am drawing from that question is, mm. I understand the concept of extreme ownership. Now, mm. if I have to evangelize it in my team, if I have to lead by example, what have some of your experiences been? Once you understood the concept of extreme ownership, how do you disseminate it to the others? Yeah, I, this is something that I'm still figuring out myself, but there are a few things that I'm, I'm trying. Uh, one is sharing the accountability ladder, uh, right? And with, with, you know, the certain people, I actually, in my one-on-one, -on -one, I actually pull it up and say, okay, so for this, like, where do you see yourself? And then how can you go further up, right? So kind of making it a more, uh, instead of talking about ownership in abstract terms, Right. I mean, that ladder is also abstract, but it's a little bit more concrete than like, are you acknowledging the problem? Are you finding solutions? Are you making it happen? Right. So I think that, that I would highly recommend that tool. It's super helpful. The the this actually I will say two more things. The second thing is a lot of times um, people want to show up as an extreme owner. They don't know what that looks like. So the more you can help somebody on your team show, you know, show what good extreme ownership looks like, right? Uh, so uh, uh, I'll give you an example. Right? I was trying to teach somebody, uh, somebody, you know, this in a previous role, um, how to do vision and vision statements and, and you know, and um, strategy for strategy deck, right? And I could have spent hours with them or, and which I did, and then I realized I should just send them a few good sample decks, right? Like having an example of what good strategy and vision looks like, I think is a way more powerful. Same in extreme ownership, right? If you can kind of show, oh, did you see this person? Like they said this, like, which was a, great, it's a huge step towards taking extreme ownership uh, versus, uh, you know, pointing out good as well as bad examples of it, I think makes it more real. And the third one, I think this is the one that I struggle with, is as a manager, you want to give your team the extreme ownership, but that also means you need to take a step back, uh, right? Because you can't be like, I'm going to be super prescriptive. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. And I want you to show up as an extreme owner, right? Because then they will be kind of in that. They're used to you doing all of the thinking and telling them what to do. 
So something that you need to be able to do as a manager is set the expectation, you know, you are the owner for this. This is in my mind what success looks like. And then give them the room to do it their own way, right? There is absolutely a chance they might fail. There is a chance they might do it better than you, right? And that's the uncertainty that you have to live with as a manager. Okay, thank you. Uh, now let me jump to the live q and I, I do have a pre -pre another pre-presented question, but let me jump to the live Q&A. Uh, Jay asks uh, if he could get a recording of this and he would want to share it with his team. Uh, Jay, absolutely. Uh, what we do is we curate this particular webinar. We will uh, write copy on it and it will be up on products that count uh, products that count.com slash resources. So you will be able to view this uh, deferred live as well. And towards that, we definitely, and, and this is this is a plug for uh, you know the, the survey, we send out a survey to all our attendees. Please let us know how you like this. This is a very quick, it's a very quick survey, it takes around uh, you know 45 seconds to a minute. It helps us share your feedback with our speakers. It tells us, you know, what should we be doing differently? So number one, yes, you could definitely get a recording of this so that you can share it with your team. And number two, you know, if you attended live or if you watched the recording, you'll get a survey, please do answer the survey. Now, the next question, this has been presented live by Divya. She asks, as an extreme owner, I care deeply or I'm passionate about my product and its delivery. That, that's what, that's the way good product managers are. Mm -hmm. She then asks, how do you share your extreme ownership goals with parallel product teams whose work affects your delivery without sounding like I'm trying to manage your portfolio, right? I mean, you, again, and then this is a delicate balance that I talked about earlier, influencing without authority. Yeah. You know, they are parallel product teams, work still depends, but, you know, I'm not trying to be too bossy, but how do I demonstrate extreme ownership in such a sense yeah uh, and this is a very real problem right your 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 success depends on another team's success they are taking their time they have their own process um, how do you influence them to align with your roadmap your timeline whatever it is um, you know I think I, I wanted to add to you know Divya this will answer your question also but I think the, one of the previous questions was um how do you influence without authority? Um, I think before you have that conversation, you need to make sure you are in the right mindset. Because what has happened with me in the past is I have been stewing about something for a while, right? And when I go to have that conversation, I'm not in the right frame of mind because in my mind, I am actually blaming that person, right? And that doesn't turn out to be a productive conversation because they become defensive. No matter how I try to set it up, even if I say that if I, you know, I mention my explicit intention, right? My frustration or my resentment comes through, right? So even when you're working with a team, uh, number one, as your engagement starts, try to set this precedence that, hey, you know, our goal is this project is successful, this program is successful, you know, we have your we have a dependency on you. Um, I kind of kind of get ahead of that and saying that you are going to play a big role in bringing them along on this journey, which could translate into weekly uh, touch points. It could translate into like, you know, you driving the design discussions, whatever that looks like in your world. The, the reason I am emphasizing on start doing it from the very beginning is because this would then not get to a point where you become resentful. Like you, you kind of set that precedence up front. So uh, let me take a step back. Um, so that if there are any problems, right, you have a forum to bring it up with the team because you are in the driver's seat. Right. So, so one thing I would do is upfront kind of set some expectations about these are the cadences, this is the timeline. Um, and let us say they come back and say, well, we can't meet this timeline, right? Get into the details with them to help them problem solve, right? Like so I think a tendency is, well, this is what we need. How can you make it happen? But a different way of doing it is, okay, so what are some of the options, right? Are there are so for example, you know, one of our teams. Um, they offer to do the work for them, 
right? So can we do, I think it's called inner source model in certain companies, right? Can that be possible? Um, if we delay our execution by two weeks, does that like kind of work with them on coming up with a solution so that they have the, the buy-in to buy in, buy in into that solution uh, rather than you dictating anything from them, right? It is a delicate balance. You want to bring them along. You want to partner with them, right? And at the same time, if you're not seeing these 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 tactics, these strategies be successful, you probably also want to start building a relationship with the leaders of uh, those teams so that you have a forum where you can say, this is what we are trying to do. This is where we need your help, right? So work with the team on the ground, build that partnership, but also invest in having relationships with the leaders of that team so that you have a forum in case things don't work out. Does that answer your question? The way I feel like I kind of meandered a little bit. Okay, so, and we will open it up to live Q&A. Um, I have uh, two more questions. They are there presented in, in the chat. Mm -hmm. The first one deals about, you know, teams, teams dynamics, managing down. Uh, Bianca asks, when someone on your team demonstrates uh, extreme ownership consistently, but they aren't ready for promotion yet, uh, how do you handle that conversation? And they further acknowledge that a PM career isn't just about checking boxes, right? It, it, there's, there's a lot more to it. So they are demonstrating extreme ownership, still not ready for that next step. How do you handle that? Yeah, so um, never mind. It's, you're absolutely right, right? So somebody could take extreme ownership, be excellent at execution, right? But that's the expectation at their level, right? To go to the next level, they have to do more than that. And, you know, for, for an, a concrete example, they might not be, let's say strategy is the expectation. And what you have observed about them that they still need to build that muscle. Um, it is, you know, I think it is, uh, it is, you know, especially if somebody, if this person is, feels like they are ready and you have to deliver them the message that no, actually there might be some work ahead. It is a difficult conversation, right? I think one thing is kind of having very clear goals for them of how they can improve on strategy. Acknowledge that they take extreme ownership. They do really well in that area. It will absolutely help them in getting to the next level, but there is this incremental piece that they you need to, to uh, they need to focus on, right? So the two parts, acknowledge what they're doing well, but also like actively coach them on the incremental part that they deliver. The other thing that, I mean, it definitely takes a hit uh, on other person's motivation, right? Whatever you can do to give them more opportunities to practice their strategy skills uh, in this, you know, for this specific example, uh, maybe, a, you know, a short, a bonus award, whatever you like, whatever motivates them, right? If you can identify them and, you know, kind of somehow keep their motivation going until they get, you know, they, they fill that gap, they address that gap and get to the next level. But yeah, I think there is yeah. no getting away from the difficult conversation that I know you think you're ready, but we yeah. have we still have some work to do. Okay. And this is the last question in the chat, and we will open it up for live Q and A. It's it's been very it's been a very insightful discussion so far. This question is slightly more philosophical, if I may say that. Uh, Erica asks. How is being an extreme owner different than being the CEO of your product? I'll repeat yeah. that. How is being an extreme owner different than being the CEO of your product? It's a really good question, Erica. And actually, you know, uh, when I was uh, preparing for this talk, uh, I had it somewhere at one point that, you know, that as product managers, we are considered the CEOs of our product, right? And I don't know if I quite buy into that uh, that narrative, right? Because when you think of the CEO, uh, CEOs have a lot more authority than product managers do, right? So I feel like we have the, the maybe the responsibility of a CEO, but none of the authority of a CEO, right? So if you are able to uh, accept that modified definition of CEO, right, which is basically I am talking about the accountability aspect, not the authority aspect, then it becomes one and the same thing, right? As an extreme owner, you are taking full accountability, but from a power or authority perspective, you, you still might not have it. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, with that, we would like to open it up to live Q&A. Um, uh, at least if, uh, you know, if anybody has a question and, and they are raising their hand or, uh, you know, uh, they are they're typing it out in chat, uh, you know, please uh, give it, uh, give the floor to them directly. So folks, we would very much welcome you to ask your questions in case you have any. Uh, in the time that folks are warming up, I'll ask my last pre-presented question. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a touchy subject. It is, it is a, it is a slightly careful subject. Mm -hmm. Given the, the negative trends in the tech industry, the recent negative trends, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. arguable. So, you know, some, some companies are laying off. If the team has low morale, right? If the team has low morale, they're, they've been affected by something. Uh, the company is facing layoffs. The energy has noticeably changed. What then? You know, how do you then still demonstrate the extreme ownership? Yeah, I mean, the... I think there is... In my mind, there's two slightly different things. Um, so, so let me answer the question. Is there are, let's say there have been layoffs in your com company. The morale is low. How do you address that? Um, I think by not sugarcoating it, uh, by acknowledging that these are difficult times, like this is an unfortunate thing that happened, that uh, the layoffs happened. It obviously impacted maybe some of your colleagues, some of your friends negatively. Also acknowledging that we don't know what would happen next, right? I mean, I think it's very tempting to say that, oh, you know, we are going, we are safe. But the thing is, we don't know that we are safe, right? So I think the, uh, a, a big part of building trust is acknowledging what you don't know, right? So I think that goes a long way. But the second thing that 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 usually helps the team is getting on with the work, like shifting the focus. I mean, layoff decisions are outside of our sphere of control. It's either even outside of our sphere of influence, right? So kind of bringing back to, well, we don't know what would happen, but what we can do today is focus on what, what's under our control, right? Which is keeping progress and making progress on addressing our customer pain points, keeping the momentum going. Now, how do you show extreme ownership? Um, I, I don't know if anything changes right? for, you know, your, 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 your motivation might dip for a while, but eventually if you are somebody who's like really buys into the extreme ownership mindset, I feel like eventually you will recover and come back to, to showing up the same way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That that's, that's quite, quite insightful again. I mean, you know, not an easy topic to talk about. Yeah. Uh, Divya has a question. Elise, if you can please uh, give her the mic so that she can ask her question live. Oh, I like the Hi. analogy of Mike. Oops. Hi, Paral. Hi, Mahit. Can you hear me? We can yes, hear please. you. Okay, thanks. Um, very nice talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It's very relatable to what's happening at my current workplace, including the layoffs. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say completely enjoyed the talk today. Uh, my question to you would be, to develop a product mindset, um, do you have any recommendations on books or audiobooks or podcasts to develop a product mindset let me think about it um i think marty kagan's book um inspired i think is the second one mahib do you remember the name of the first one they're very uh, well-known books i let me just google it the name just yeah. slipped my mind as well just a yeah. tip of the tongue uh, so, phenomenon there so divya marty kagan is pretty much known as the I want to say the father of product management in the Bay Area. And his books on product management are really insightful, right? especially if your goal is to develop a product mindset. Uh, they I are highly... inspired and empowered. What was the first one? Inspired is the first book. Okay. Uh, and empowered is the second. Empowered is the second one. Yeah. yeah. So I would, I would highly recommend those. Um, I'm trying to think what are some of the other books or podcast. There is a podcast. Uh, I don't remember his last name, but his first name is Lenny. Um, I think Google by Lenny's podcast, product podcast. So what he does is he interviews, you know, um, execs or founders 
from 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 uh, you know some of the well known companies and i have learned a lot from that podcast now it is geared a little bit more towards entrepreneurs right but at some level product managers are also entrepreneurs right so it also it talks about product craft his guests also talk about leadership so um that's that's a part that's one of my favorite podcasts that's one i would highly recommend okay uh, yeah i think those are the ones that i can think of from top of my head i don't know mahip if you have any recommendations yes. Yes, yes, I do have uh, recommendations. Yeah. One of them is going to be a strong plug for products that count. Oh, there we uh, go. Yeah. Vivia, in our resources section, products that count dot com slash resources, you will find links to previous talks, right? And I've found some of them to be very, very helpful when I myself have to review a topic. When there is a topic I am dwelling on, when there is a conversation that I need to have. um i often go and look at those podcasts they have copies uh, you know written on them um uh, so that that is going to be a very very uh, helpful resource for you as well uh if you can connect with me on linkedin or if you are able to send me a message there are a couple of people i also follow on linkedin uh one of them uh, is this this gentleman i i think his first name is arthur um he is a director of product uh, in canada at, at bfairs his podcasts are very dense right his 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 um, his topics the ones he write about on uh, you know um, on linkedin are very very dense and information heavy i often have to reread them but the what he talks about makes sense what he talks about is is practical product experience that you know you talked about building your product since you talk about building your you know your product chops uh, you know he he definitely talks sense right so uh, you can find me on uh, products uh, products that count website that has a link to my uh, you know linkedin profile and i'll also you know type it out here so definitely do ping me there and i'll be i'll be happy to send you a link to their profile and you can uh, you can probably follow them so i've recently found that resource to be to be very very helpful so again products that count you know ask away there are there are people who are who publish podcasts there are people who who come and talk to us like parol you know we have webinars that's a good resource for you and then of course there are you'll find you know plenty of podcasts and reading material on on linkedin as well right well, uh does that answer your question the best is that yeah. are those the kind of resources you were looking for yeah 100% uh thank you so much yeah. i really appreciate it yes yes uh folks we are almost at time um we could uh, parul if you are okay with going just a couple of minutes over to see if anybody has a has a pending question any yeah, yeah. Uh, any last minute question yeah yeah absolutely okay I do, I do see one. one. Uh, it I believe it's Divya who has her hand up in Q and A. Okay. In Q and A. Okay. Yes, yes. There is there is one. Uh, what they are asking is uh, to build the execution muscle as a PM, right? What do you recommend practicing and doing? The well, there is of course the the theoretical aspect of it. but then when you are in the trenches as a pm or as a leader of product how do you learn how do you practice how do you get better at what is it that you do so this is this is such a it's such a broad question right how do you get better at execution yeah uh, one is just by doing it honestly i feel like the best way to do it the thing is you know you every time you execute on something you're going to make a mistake right that just just given right you know i mean th- i don't think there is a concept as you get 100% of your requirements up front right you, the best you can get is 80% there will always be things come up but over time you realize okay these are the kind of things that come back and bite you and you become more careful about them right so the number one thing you can do to develop that muscle is to just keep executing them right so as you grow in your career you automatically get better at it the other two things that i would say uh, to get good at to think about execution is work backwards 
right? What is the outcome that you're trying to drive for? And then what are the most important things you can do to deliver that outcome? Because what happens is a lot of times it becomes more about the project execution rather than the, the outcome. So, so something that I have been trying to drive with my product team is having this slide which says, this, this is our customer, this is the customer pain point, this is our intended outcome, right? The, the more you can keep that front and center of your mind, your team's mind, that this is our goal, you can make more focused, more relevant, more the better decisions you can make, right? And the third thing is, you know, what, what I've talked about a little bit is you have to find that, you know, as a product manager, you're going to get into the details, right? You have to have, you know, your user stories and, you know, still getting into the solutions, all of those things, you have to do that. But also being able to take a step back and being able to assess, kind of look around the corner and say, where could we fail? Right? What are the things that could go wrong? If you can kind of develop that, if you can actively ask that question of yourself, of other teams, like where do you see points of failure, right? I think that goes a long way in, in getting better at execution. But like I said, the number one thing is the more you do it, the better you get. You just don't make the same mistakes again and again, because then you won't get better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Our absolute last question for today, I promise. Uh, this has been very, very helpful. It, it's, it's a topic that you know, you care deeply about. It's a topic when you and I had started brainstorming. This is what yeah. we had wanted to talk about. Why extreme ownership? Why does it matter to you? It's a, it's a rhetorical question. It, there, there could have been many approaches. I'm sure, yeah. you know, to climb the ladder, folks, many use many yeah. approaches in startups, in bigger corporations. Why care about extreme ownership? Yeah, I think, you know, I... I'll give you an example. I'll give you an answer from two different perspectives, right? First, my example is from a, a manager perspective. Like I already touched upon this, right? I, I you know, I have managed many people uh, uh, at this point in my career, and I see a very clear difference in uh, how I manage somebody who takes extreme ownership versus doesn't, right? And the people who take extreme ownership, my job is so much easier. It's so much easier for me to go advocate for them. It's so much easier for me to grow them. It's just like, it's so much easier for me to appreciate them, right? And I feel like that's how I want my manager to think of me. Like, like that I want them to know that I got it, right? So like, I think that's when I, when I kind of noticed that difference in how people show up, to me, it was like, it was a very strong motivation. I want to be seen a particular way by my leaders, Right. So that's one, like the perception of how I want others to experience me. Right. The second thing is my own um, state of mind, my own peace of mind. You know, a few years ago, um, I was trying to deliver something and I was stuck. Right. My engineering partner was not doing what he was supposed to do. And like, I feel like I spent six months just complaining about it to anybody who would hear it. And you know, I just felt so dissatisfied with where I was. And I just was extremely unhappy, like, because I just felt helpless. And once I was able to make that switch, like, wait, I'm going to do something to solve this problem. Like my entire perspective changed, right? I kind of got unstuck, right? And I want more of that in my life. I want more focus on what I can control and less complaining, right? So every time I have been able to really live through extreme ownership, it has just made me happier. Right. In the short term, it's more stressful because I am doing a lot more things, but overall, my happiness level has gone up. So it's both how I experience me and how others experience me is why this is yeah. important to me. Yeah. Thank you. And and that's part of you know what you can control. Yeah. So Parul, thank you. We are we are way over time. Thank you so much for this topic. Thank you. You know, it's it's evident that you know you are passionate about it and you know your your insights are. Uh, you know, they come from deep experience. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, folks, with that, I would be signing off from Product That Count for a while uh, as well. This is my, I've been here, uh, you know, close to 25, 26 months. This is probably the, the 20th webinar that I have been doing. Mm -hmm. And we will be passing the baton over to a new uh, head of chapter for, uh, for San Francisco. Uh, keep, uh, you know, attuned to our, uh, to our emails, uh, you know, uh, 
tons of uh, material is coming tons of podcasts are coming from products that count more webinars uh, you know that you can uh, that you can uh, think about so you know uh, please do stay engaged uh, with that parul thank you very much again uh, elise back to you all right thank you both this has been our most engaging q and a that we've had and our first live um question in a while so that's a kudos to the both of you thank you so oh, much thank you divya yeah yes I think we all can relate to that top of extreme ownership in our personal lives and our professional lives. So this is incredible. And Mahib, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure working with you. And to our audience, this again will go live on our website tomorrow with the video. I'll make sure to link those podcasts that were mentioned in the books, as well as both of their LinkedIn's. And it'll live there indefinitely. And y'all have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much. Bye, thank both you. of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.